my name is Chris Taylor and my topic was do regenerative farming practices pave the way for UK agriculture to meet net zero? As Tom mentioned, I've got a real passion for UK agriculture and as someone who's not from a farming background, the thing I wanted the most is to farm myself. With the way to net zero paved as the UK agriculture going down to trees, this does not sit well with me. And I wanted to show through my scholarship that it was another way to meet net zero that didn't involve UK agriculture being put down to trees to offset heavy emitting industries with us importing our own food. The inspiration for this came from a skiing trip with my wife, Beth, to France. We had just come down from the top of the Aiguille de Midi from underneath Mont Blanc and a 20 kilometer off piste run we got to the bottom and our guide said, we've got a few steps for you to go up back to the cable car. He had lived in France for about 20 years and when he first moved there, the cable car took you on to the glacier. Now there are 580 steps to climb back up to the cable car that used to sit at the glacier and there are these haunting plaques which show where the glacier stood in previous years. The speed at which the glacier is retreating is colossal and the steps that have been added in recent years, vast. What relevance does this have to UK agriculture, you might ask, and my role as an agronomist? Climate change is having a huge effect on agriculture, exposing our current cropping systems to extremes of rainfall and drought. <clears throat> a farm's resilience to climate change is going to underpin the long-term viability of that farm business going into the future. I wanted to understand if practices involved in regenerative agriculture could provide us a more resilient, profitable, productive cropping system with improved climate benefits. As part of my study, I started off in Canada, the USA and Brazil, looking for that real big picture thinking from a country that was used to massive extremes in their weather and have been practicing regenerative agriculture for decades. The second part of my journey, I want to return to Europe to make sure that climatic and environmental conditions were considered in my overall picture. And I traveled extensively through France, Norway, Denmark, and the UK. My first stop was to Canada to meet pioneers such as Blake Vince, Woody Van Arkel, and Harold Perry to gain a better understanding of the challenges faced in this vast country. Wind erosion was a huge threat to soil health there, alongside climate that experienced highs of plus 40 and lows of minus 40. I heard a lot about soil health improvements that have been realised through regenerative practices and this system gave this country a resilience even with the extremes they faced. From there, I moved on to the USA and visit, visited Iowa, Illinois, South Dakota, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. In a country epitomized by genetically modified crops, it was actually the organic sector and those on a regenerative journey that I gained the most value from. A lot of people talk about no-till corn like it just happens. And this was a, a trip to Dale Lornsteins who told me about his journey to no-till corn, which involved an eight-year period of strip-till before he earned the right to go into no-till corn. It was fascinating hear, hearing someone actually tell me how they had gained the right to go no-till and the changes that he'd seen in his soils and his productivity over that time. The eight-year journey started at an organic matter of 3.5%. By the time he finished, he was at 5 and had seen massive fuel savings in that journey. From there, I moved on to see Dr. Joel Groover at Western Illinois University, who was pioneer pioneering a no-till organic system that revolved around crimping rye, leaving that mulch on the top, not disturbing the soil surface, and with a country that experiences massive problems with resistance to glyphosate. These were some of the cleanest soya beans I'd seen on the whole of my travels, and they were organic. This really made me consider my position as an agronomist and what we should be doing culturally to avoid inputs. 
that are unnecessary and just build resistance issues. My naivety to the scale of the USA was exposed when I left Illinois in the morning to go across to South Dakota. When my satnav told me in 358 miles, keep going straight, I knew I was in for a long day. <laughs> Some 674 miles later, I arrived at Pierre to find my hotel room had been given up because they didn't think I was arriving. And I had to walk down the street with my massive suitcase uh, at about 11 p.m. to go and find somewhere to stay. That trip was worth it for a visit to the home of regenerative agriculture that is the Dakota Lakes Research Farm. They experience very little in-season rainfall here. And they rely upon capturing snow melt, not losing any moisture through evapotranspiration, and the manipulation of ground cover and surface residues to ensure they grab as much of that rainfall as they can. This was Sam Island out digging in one of the fields, and you can see how long they leave their stubble there to A, capture the snow, B, reduce the risk of soil erosion from wind, and C, <coughs> to ensure they're building good organic matter and resilience in that soil. A study called, carried out by Cornell University demonstrated that that soil could take 10 inches of rainfall per hour without any runoff occurring. This absolutely blew my mind, and Sam was a real pioneer that was demonstrating to other farmers in that county what, what could happen with good soil health. Up until this stage of my journey, I'd really been fixated with how we could put as much carbon into the soil as possible, and this figure of 0.1% sequestered carbon for nine tonnes of CO2 per year was something that had really hung with me. It was my initial goal, but what I found to be a very intangible benefit when I was going round. Everyone I'd met in Canada and the United States had told me about organic matter increases, but they had come through change in practices for other reasons. And I started to reconsider what the last four weeks of my study should look like in order to gain more tangible benefits that I could bring back and talk to you about today. Some of the things I heard about were workload improvements, productivity improvements, profitability, timeliness, the pre prevention of wind and water erosion. And I really decided at this stage that I needed to look at the emissions as well as sequestration. I felt the European part of my leg needed to focus more on getting a good balance and not just on sequestration. And that's where I met JB um, Baptiste here. I'd done a little bit of research before heading to their farms and I realised that 90% of greenhouse gas emissions on your average UK arable farm come down to fertiliser, fuel use and operations. This was a very fortunate visit for me that JB actually farmed both sides of this field but the right hand side was under his own management and the left hand side was a tenanted farm that had asked him to plough. JB was devastated that he had to plough this field, or at least half of it. We started walking across the wheat after sunflowers. There was residue all over the surface. There was earthworm middens everywhere, and you could just tell this, this field was alive. We got onto the piece on the left, and JB started kicking the dirt and saying, it's dead, it's like the moon. That's all very well and good for me to say. Some of the detail I got into with JB was fascinating. The right-hand side cost him seven litres a hectare of fuel to establish. The left-hand side, 45 litres a hectare of fuel. So a fuel saving alone of 37 litres a hectare. The establishment cost for the right-hand side, 80 euros per hectare. The establishment cost for the left, 180 euros per hectare. Moving on to some fertility benefits, I met Gilaine, who was one of Baptiste's uh, Baptiste neighbours. <clears throat> he had half the farm in organic, half in conventional, and it was the organic side which was really fascinating to me of how he built fertility through a rotation. Lucerne was one of the unsung heroes of my study, I think. 
especially in the organic sector, for building fertility through a rotation. And you can see Gilain is very pleased with his newly established lucerne there, feeding, feeding that cereal crop with, uh, with nutrition through the season. This lucerne root has been in the ground for six months and it was down several feet already. Absolutely incredible, the soil health benefits that brought as well as fertility. And Gilain, you can see, very happy with his, his root in there. The end of my study brought about the time to write my report and come up with my take-home messages. I'm really, my theory on this is the best time to have sampled your soils for soil organic matter was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Once you've got that as a baseline, you can measure your performance and see where you've got areas for improvement. Once you've done that, there's plenty of pioneers and people in this room who you can ask for support and guidance, people who have already been down some of these journeys or, or on their way. And what we really want is to build a more resilient farm business to mitigate climate change, rising input costs and resistance issues. For me, I wouldn't get too hung up about net zero being that ultimate goal and having carbon tunnel vision. There's a lot of benefits that come from adopting regenerative practices, such as I've explained through fuel savings, time savings, input savings. And really, if you're selling carbon credits off the farm, ensure you're not undermining your own potential to hit net zero in the future. Post my Nuffield scholarship, I've come back with a head that's buzzing full of ideas, but also a lot of questions that need to be answered. So I've taken a research job, <clears throat> which has allowed me to answer some of these questions in a more structured way. And I've also taken on an independent agronomy arm that allows me to give regenerative transitionary advice to people to help them on that journey, decoupled from supply. I'd like to thank McDonald's UK and Ireland for the opportunity and the funding to do my study. I'd like to thank Nuffield Farming Scholarship Trust for the opportunity to go and my wife and daughter for supporting me through what was a very uh, stressful two years with uh, a young daughter and having to travel extensively through the world. Thank you very much.